This is the second video of a series about the Lilantine War, a conflict between the neighbouring settlements of Chalcis and Eretria in Euboea or Evia in the late 8th or early 7th century BCE, a war for and over the fertile Lelantine plain that lies between them. In our first video, we considered how Euboea was a beacon of civilization during the period now unfashionably known as the Greek Dark Age, which began after the fall of the Bronze Age Mycenaean palace civilization in the 12th century BCE or thereabouts. By the time of the Lelantine War, the people of Euboea were at the vanguard of the re-emergence of the civilizations of Greece. Had things turned out differently, then perhaps today we would cite Cal Chalkis is the epicenter of the 5th century golden age. But that's not how the story goes. Rather, though the details are hazy to say the least, it seems that Euboea ceded its role as the leading light of Hellenic culture to others, to Athens for one, in the wake perhaps of the Lilantine War. In this video we'll consider the written sources for the war that have come down to us from the ancient world. Welcome to Ancient Classics. Our literary sources for the Lilantine War are scant and are of doubtful quality and utility. That should not be too much of a surprise. Writing had only recently been reintroduced into Greek at the time of the war. Now it is possible that poetry may have been first put into writing around this time, but as for formal written history, well, Herodotus, who's usually cited as the first historian in the European tradition, was writing around 250 years after the war. So our sources are pretty rubbish, but better than for any other conflict in Greece at the time or earlier. Here they are. Don't thank me, though. This is nothing you can't get from the Wikipedia page. Let's start with Herodotus and Thucydides, both writing in the 5th century BCE. Thucydides a little later than Herodotus. Thucydides begins his history of the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta with a remarkable prologue wherein he attempts to summarise and explain the entire socio-political history of the Greek-speaking peoples. Necessarily, considering that his ultimate theme is the Peloponnesian War, Thucydides considers the conflicts that the Greeks fought over the years, alongside and against each other. He makes a sweeping statement that, for the most part, save for exceptional expeditions such as the Trojan War and maritime clashes and colonial wars, land wars between or involving the Greeks were isolated bilateral affairs, wars between neighbours. Not so the Lelantine War. But it was chiefly in the war that arose a long time ago between the Chalcidians and the Eretrians that all the rest of Hellas took sides in alliance with one side or the other. That's usually taken to be a reference to the Lelantine War. Now Thucydides doesn't call it that. In fact, so far as I'm aware, few of the ancients did. The war is usually described as that between Chalcis and Eretria. Which means we never really know if any given author is actually speaking about our Lilantine War, but there you go. Thucydides seems to be drawing attention to the fact that the war was remarkable because it marked the engagement of peoples from across Greece in a local war. But as Hornblower points out in his commentary on the passage, the involvement of such distant powers is certainly remarkable. But note the context. Thucydides' point is that the Lilantine War was the nearest thing to concerted Greek action of a kind which was normally lacking. So the organised international character of the war should not be exaggerated, as it has sometimes been. Indeed, it's worth acknowledging the view that the Lilantine War is totally overhyped, something I'm guilty of myself. There is indeed a rhetorical, or perhaps it would be fairer to say literary, element to Thucydides' mention of the war, which is not to say that he was fabricating it, but he may have put a particular spin on it to suit his theme. Maybe he's highlighting and exaggerating the multilateral nature of the war so as to set up some kind of precursor to his own theme, the Peloponnesian War, a war between two poles, Athens and Sparta, but which involved so many of their respective allies. So who were the allies fighting for Chalcis and Eretria? Well, in Book 5 of his histories, Herodotus is describing the lead-up to the Ionian revolt against the Persians one of the key causes or precursors to Darius's attempted invasion of Greece. Incidentally, before being pushed back by the Athenians and the Plataeans at Marathon, Darius had occupied Eretria itself, but back to the matter at hand. Herodotus describes how Aristagoras of Miletus had successfully petitioned the Athenians to send a naval fleet to Miletus. 
the Athenians sent 20 triremes, accompanied by a further five from Eretria. This prompts Herodotus to explain why the Eretrians sent their ships at all. The Athenians came with their 20 ships, bringing with them five triremes of the Eretrians, who came to the war to please not the Athenians, but the Malaysians themselves, thereby repaying their debt. For earlier, the Malaysians had been the allies of the Eretrians in the war against Chalcis, when the Samians came to the aid of the Chalcidians against the Eretrians and the Malaysians. So that's all we have from the 5th century. Two brief mentions of a war between Chalcis and Eretria, supported by their respective allies, 250 odd years after the event. And bear in mind that the gap between the Lilantine War and the time of Herodotus and Thucydides is roughly the same as that between the American Revolutionary War and the present day. The big difference being, of course, that we have loads of written sources from the 18th century. Our next, orbit more detailed sources, Strabo and Plutarch, come from a much later period altogether. The first and second centuries, i.e. around three quarters of a millennium after the event. Now, presumably they had their own, now lost sources to refer to. Who knows what though? Some people have guessed that one of the sources may have been this guy from Eubea called Archemakos, on no special grounds other than that Strabo cites him as a source for other bits of early Eubean history. Strabo does however cite what we would call an epigraphic source, an inscription on a pillar from Amarinthus, I think, just down the coast from Eretria. This brings us to one of the most mysterious and provocative passages from ancient times about the war. Strabo writes, Now in general these cities, i.e. Chalcis and Eretria, were in accord with one another, and when differences arose concerning the Lilantine plain, they did not so completely break off relations as to wage their wars in all respects according to the will of each, but they came to an agreement as to the conditions under which they were to conduct the fight. This fact, among others, is disclosed by a certain pillar in the Amarinthium, which forbids the use of long-distance missiles. This gives us a somewhat different picture of a conflict between two neighbours who, whilst perhaps rivals, were not so bitterly disposed to each other. And it gives no mention of bringing other allies into the conflict. But more curiously still is that on the basis of this now lost epigraphical evidence, the combatants seem to have or were reported to have agreed to a code of conduct for the war, a pact not to use missiles against each other. Strabo continues... In fact, among all the customs of warfare and of the use of arms, there neither is nor has there been any single custom. For some use long-distance missiles, as for example bowmen and slingers and javelin throwers, whereas others use close fighting arms, as for example those who use sword or outstretched spear. For the spear is used in two ways, one in hand-to-hand -hand combat and the other for hurling like a javelin, just as the pike serves both purposes, for it can be used in both both close combat and as a missile for hurling. Now Strabo's reference to the purported abjuration of missiles is sometimes linked with a passage from the 7th century BCE poet Archilochos. Not many bows will be stretched, nor will there be numerous slings. Whenever Ares brings together the press of battle on the plain, it will be the woeful work of swords. This is the warfare in which those spear-famed lords of Eubea are skilled. It is tempting to cite Archilochus' poem as evidence of the specific abjuration of missiles in the Lilantine War, as described by Strabo. But the poet doesn't quite say as much, he doesn't refer to any treaty, and there are older references in Homer no less to the Eubians, or rather the Abantes, as being excellent close combat fighters, references which Strabo himself acknowledges. But nonetheless, this purported agreement between Chalcis and Eretria to refrain from fighting with missiles is sometimes cited as an early example of an arms control treaty or some such. I even found mention of it in a book published by the Rand Corporation of all things. The chapter from which the following excerpt comes is an early attempt, by which I mean from the 1990s, to construct a theory of or policy for the use of information technology in warfare. Funny how even the 1990s feels like ancient history, right? But anyway... The chapter starts with a survey of the ethics and theory of warfare. A remarkable consistency characterises thinking about just 
wars, from ancient to modern times. Thus, nearly three millennia ago, concerns were advanced about the need for an ethical approach to going to war, as well as to waging war. For example, the ancient Greek geographer Strabo observed that in the War of the Lilantine Plain, circa 700 BCE, all parties agreed to ban the use of projectile missiles because they constituted an ethically repugnant form of war. Well, that's reading an awful lot into Strabo. But anyway, I'll return to this passage of Strabo and its purported references to some kind of arms treaty and consider some of its more romanticized interpretations in the next video, when I'll reflect more generally on what the Lilantine War means or symbolizes for the development of classical civilization in Greece. For now, let's move on to one last substantial literary source, Plutarch. There's a piece, an essay, I guess you could call it, which is typically compiled within Plutarch's Moralia. It is called the Eroticos, i.e. the one about Eros. It's a dialogue on the nature of love, illustrated by various love stories. One such story is set in the Lilantine War, and it's about this guy called Cleomachus and his boyfriend. Cleomachus came to help the Chalcidians when the Lilantine War against the Eretrians was at its height. The Chalcidian infantry was thought to have considerable strength, but they found it difficult to resist the enemy cavalry. Accordingly, his allies requested Cleomachus, a man of splendid courage, to be the first to charge the horse. His boyfriend was there, and Cleomachus asked him if he was going to witness the battle. The youth said that he was, embraced Cleomachus tenderly, and put on his helmet for him. Filled with ardour, Cleomachus assembled the bravest of the Thessalians about him, made a fine charge, and fell upon the enemy with such vigour that their cavalry was thrown into confusion and was thoroughly routed. When subsequently their hoplites also fled, the Chalcidians had a decisive victory. It was, however, Cleomachus's bad fortune to be killed in the battle. The Chalcidians point out his tomb in the marketplace, with the great pillar standing on it to this day. Formerly, they had frowned on homosexual relations between men and youths, but now they accepted it and honoured it more than others did. Now, Aristotle says that the circumstances of Cleomachus's death in Victoria's battle with the Eretrians were different, and that the lover embraced by his friend was one of the Chalcidians from Thrace, sent as an ally to the Chalcidians of Eubea. Plutarch's story is the only source that people cite to back the commonly held presumption that it was Chalcis that won the war. Though the story only says that Chalcis won the battle, it doesn't quite go so far as to say they definitely won the whole war. Indeed, everyone seems to read way too much into this passage, I feel extrapolating from this story some narrative about how the Chalcidians were strong infantry fighters but couldn't win in the face of the Eretrian cavalry, and that the tide of the war was only turned when the allies, such as the Thessalians, came and provided cavalry support for the Chalcidians. I don't know, it feels like reading a little bit too much into it. Even Plutarch says that an Aristotle, perhaps not the Aristotle, suggests that something totally different went down. With such scarcity of materials, however, it seems like everyone, myself included, can't but seem to read too much into whatever they have. <laughs> Hey-ho. Though the alternative version of the story, that Cleomachus's boyfriend was a Thracian of Chalcidian origin, is a nice touch, if it is true. As I mentioned in the last video, the Eubians had established colonies way up north in Thrace, so it's interesting to see those connections operating on a military geopolitical basis too at the time. Now it's worth quoting another Plutarch passage as some kind of crude segue onto our next batch of literary sources, closer in time to the war, but real barrel scrapers. Plutarch's Symposium ton hepta sophon, or the dinner of the seven wise men, is one of those kind of imaginary chats between old sages over dinner. There seems to have been loads of those kind of works. Anyway, there's a passage which goes, For we have the story that the most famous poets among the wise men of that time gathered at Chalcis to attend the funeral of Amphidamus. Now, Amphidamus was a warrior who had given much trouble to the Eretrians and had fallen in one of the battles for the possession of the Lilantine Plain. So this Amphidamus fellow, Hesiod, in his Works and Days, mentions that he won a song contest at the funeral games for this guy. There I myself crossed over into Chalcis for the games of Valorous 
Amphidamus, that great-hearted man's sons, had announced and established many prizes, and there I declare I gained victory with a hymn and carried off a tripod with handles. This song contest seems to have a core place in the imagined or romanticised literary tradition. It's the scene of the contest of Homer and Hesiod, which I considered in a video about a year ago on the Epigonoi. Anyway, Hesiod makes no connection with the Lelantine War per se, though I guess it's roughly the right period. The fact that Plutarch does, well, read into that what you will. And I've already cited an excerpt from Archilochus, talking about the Euboeans' preference for melee weapons over missiles. Now, Archilochus comes from around the period of the Lilantine War itself, so it's proved too tempting for people not to speculate that he fought in the war. I don't know, maybe he did, maybe he didn't. It's all a bit tenuous. So yeah, that's just about all the literary sources we have, I think. Let us know in the comments if you're aware of any others, because I'm done here. But I promised in the previous video to talk about the causes of the war. Well, it's safe to say no one knows. Most theories have got no further than citing what seems trivially true. Calchis and Eretria are neighbours, the Lelantine Plain is fertile and stands between them, seems fairly obviously like the war was some kind of border dispute or dispute for neighbouring resources. To quote Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, no shit, Sherlock. But was there any particular reason, any particular trigger for the clash? Maybe. In a much cited paper from the 1970s, the excellently named John McKesson Camp II catalogues the evidence for a widespread drought, famine and disease across Attica and the islands around, including Eubea, in the late 8th century. So yeah, maybe that exacerbated tensions between the neighbours. Or the causes may have originated from further afield. Parker, in the one book on the Lilantine War, which is in German, catalogues various theories at length, evidence for some kind of economic tension between two colonial powers, though he's sceptical of the over-keenness of some to pin everything on a trade war. Parker posits the theory that relations between Calchis and Eretria may have soured owing to stasis between factions in Pithecusae. Pithecusae was a site on Ischia, just of Naples, where the famous cup of Nesta was found. It was established as a Euboean colony. Strabo writes, Pithecusae was once set by Eretrians and also Chalcadians, who although they had prospered there on account of the fruitfulness of the soil and on account of the gold mines, they forsook the island as a result of stasis. Stasis is one of those kind of classic Greek words that can't really be translated other than as sort of um, unrest or civil strife. But anyway, it's tempting to say that stasis might have been a trigger for the war back in Euboea, but as Parker points out, the events referred to by Strabo are muddled and impossible to date. So yeah, the cause of the war or, beyond the obvious, is all a matter of pure speculation. Speaking of speculation, Donald Bradeen goes to quite convoluted lengths to ascribe the war to a power struggle in which the Argive statesman Phidon played a distinctive role. According to Bradeen's theory, in the period immediately after the colonisation of the West, Chalcis and Corinth worked together in that area and built a trading monopoly. Meanwhile, Eretria was gaining control over the central Cyclades. Miletus was opening the northeast. Samus and, I and Aegina were beginning to vie along with Miletus for the rich trade of Egypt. In the Peloponnese, Sparta had just conquered Messenia. Then, with the accession of Phidon, circa 710 BC, Argos became a power to be reckoned with. Bradin next details Phidon's commercial and military campaigns and political dealings. How he went about expanding his power and influence across the region taking sides and lending his support to various localised struggles between settlements or powers across Greece. After a period of consolidation, Phidon turned his attention to the West, Elis and the Olympic Games, control of the Corinthian Gulf, and finally trade with Italy and Sicily. At this time, perhaps about 675 BC, a war broke out between Chalcis and Eretria over the Lilantine Plain. By supporting Eretria, Phidon saw a chance to crush, or at least immobilise, one of the two Western powers. Bradine then leaning heavily, perhaps too heavily, on Plutarch's story of Cleomachus and his boyfriend, tell of how the Chalcadians won the war, but only after receiving the aid of cavalry reinforcements. 
With the additional cavalry, the Chalcadians defeated the Eretrians and so gained possession of the plain. The Lilantine War proper was over, but its repercussions lingered on. Phidon defeated the Spartans at Hysiae and gained control of the Olympic Games. This led to the revolt of the Messenians and also brought on the revolt of Corcyra from Corinth, probably managed by the Eretrians in Corcyra at Phidon's instigation. At last, Phidon was killed. I'm really not sure where Bredin got all that from, and he himself admits that his account is a reconstruction on, at times, the slimmest of evidence. But he defends his position as a unifying theory, taking into account and reconciling all the evidence such as it is. Specifically, he notes that his account also resolves the apparent contradiction in our sources for the war, that it attracted more allies than any other struggle, yet seems to have been fought mainly by Chalkis and Eretria on the plain itself. Itself. When we connect it with Phidon's ambitions, his enemies and allies, the contradiction disappears. To that extent, Bradeen sees the war as a Pan-Hellenic war. Its main theatre may have been the small area between Chalkis and Eretria, but it was, as Bradeen puts it, only an episode in a larger struggle. I don't know what to make of all that, but whatever one might have to say about the details and specifically how this all ties in with Phidon, let's go with the idea that the Lilantine War was in some way or other a Pan-Hellenic affair, intimately tied in with broader regional power struggles, and certainly both Thucydides and Herodotus seem to support that. So now we're really turning to the bigger picture, the grand scheme of history that I referred to with some self-conscious embarrassment in the last video. But what the hell, let's go full in for speculative, romanticized, big picture stuff. But next time. Till then, like and subscribe and we'll be back soon. <laughs>